Okay, good evening, and welcome to this Forum for Philosophy event on Susan Stebbing. We're still online for the foreseeable future, so thank you for joining us wherever you are. I'm sure many of you have more Zooms and online meetings in your life these days, so thank you for joining us to listen to some philosophy this evening. Our topic this evening is Susan Stebbing, her ideas and her philosophical legacy. We've enlisted some experts to help us get a better sense of her work, but two quick notes before I introduce them. One, we are grateful to the Royal Institute of Philosophy and the British Society of the History of Philosophy for sponsorship of this event. So thank you to the RIP and BSHP. Um, second note is on the format. So we'll have about 55 minutes for the panelists to discuss their topic and 15 or 20 minutes for audience Q&A. There are two ways to ask questions, depending on how you're watching this. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can simply pop a question into the comments there and we will look for it. And if you're watching in Zoom, then you can use the Q&A function there. Um, okay, so let me introduce our speakers. Mike Beanie is Regis Professor of Logic at the University of Aberdeen and Professor of History of Analytic Philosophy at Humboldt University. Siobhan Chapman is Professor of English at University of Liverpool. And Peter West is a teaching fellow in early modern philosophy at Durham University. I'm Claire Moriarty, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the philosophy department at Trinity College Dublin. Okay, Siobhan, I'm going to come to you first. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about Susan Stebbing's life and her biography? Yes, thank you, Claire. And I think it's a great place to start because Stebbing's life context is really significant in the story that we're going to be talking about. This, this evening, um, her, her life, particularly her, her adult life and her, her working uh, career took place against a time of incredible change, uh, philosophical change, but also social and political change. And those, uh, those areas are all reflected in, in her work in, in ways which I think we'll be, we'll be discussing this evening. Um, she was born in 1885 in North London. We don't know a lot about Stebbing's early life and, and her childhood. Uh, we know that she was the youngest of six children and the family seemed to have lost both parents relatively early in her, in her life. Uh, Stebbing was certainly by the time she uh, was ready to go to university, she was in the care of a guardian. Um, Stebbing didn't have any formal schooling until she was 15. Um, that wasn't actually that unusual for middle-class Victorian girls at the time. But in Stebbing's case as well, I think this was sort of um, heightened by the fact that she was considered to be a delicate child and it wasn't thought that formal education would, would, be, uh, would be good for her at an early age. You might be fact, asking what delicate would mean in that context. Well, yes, I mean, I think the Victorians were quite keen to, or quite quick to label children, particularly girls, as being, as being delicate. Um, in fact, Stebbing did have some significant health issues, which um, I'm not sure to what extent and how early these were picked up on, but she was certainly considered not to be sort of physically able to take on um, serious study at, at an early age. Um, Stebbing suffered uh, throughout her life with what we know, now know to have been Meniere's disease, which is a disorder of the inner ear, uh, which uh, health issues were you know, a feature throughout her, her life and increasingly um, disability uh, was something that she had to, had to deal with. Uh, those who knew her in later life uh, recall that she had mobility issues um, and sometimes was unable to, 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 to walk at all um, and increasingly suffered from loss of hearing as well. So we can trace, I think, these later uh, issues in, in her life to, to this early undiagnosed delicacy, as it were. Um, Despite that, however, she did succeed in getting her own way and, and going to Cambridge. She went up to Girton College in Cambridge in, uh, in 1904. I think even then, however, her choice of subject was constrained by what was considered appropriate for uh, a, a Victorian young woman who was considered to be uh, of delicate health. Um, some accounts say that what she really wanted to study was classics. Some accounts say that what she really wanted to study was a science degree, but certainly those two were both considered by her family to be too demanding uh, for her physically. Um, and so she went up to study history, uh, which I'll say was not, her, well, was not her first choice. And in fact, she didn't stay with history for very long. Um, she, um, a few years into her studies in Cambridge, she came across what we would now call philosophy. It was moral sciences at Cambridge in the early 20th century. And she immediately switched her uh, studies over to moral sciences. Um, after that, in uh, 1908, however, she left Cambridge and moved to London, 
without completing her, her studies in moral science. That might sound like a bit of a strange thing to do, a uh, mid, mid degree subject, but the reason for that, I'm, I'm pretty certain, is that in those days, uh, as a woman, she would not have been able to take a degree in uh, at Cambridge. Um, Cambridge, in fact, didn't uh, award degrees to women until after Stedding's lifetime. It was actually 1947 when the first woman graduated from Cambridge. But in London, she would have been able to take a degree. And in fact, she graduated in 1912 with an MA from King's College London in, in Moral Sciences. Um, well, now trying to start out in an academic career, Stedding took, as, as many people do, a variety of um, short-term, temporary, um, posts, um, part-time posts, teaching and, and lecturing. Relatable. Sorry? <laughs> Very relatable. <laughs> well, indeed, we all, we've all been there, haven't we? Um, and during this time as well, I think perhaps uncertain as to whether she would actually uh, be able to achieve uh, an academic career. Uh, she uh, set up with a, a couple of friends, she set up um, uh, a girls' school in, in, in London the Kingsley Lodge School for Girls. This, although Stebbing did, uh, of course, go on to have a, a full and successful academic career, this was an incredibly important aspect of her life from then on. She stayed with the school, she stayed with that group of friends uh, throughout the rest of her life and was, was heavily committed to the, the school. It was, in effect, her home, and, and this became her, her new family for, for the rest of her life. Um, however, she didn't stay as a school teacher because um, in... Uh, in 1920, she did finally achieve the goal of uh, a lectureship in philosophy, um, and that was at Bedford College for Women in London. And she stayed, in fact, at, at Bedford College for, for the rest of her career, the rest of her, of her life. And that was where, you know, she, she did the work that we'll be mainly talking about this evening. Um, in 1933, she literally made headline news by becoming the first woman uh, professor of philosophy in the UK. And this was reported in, in, in large headlines by many um, local and indeed national newspapers. It was, it was a big event. Um, she almost <laughs> went even further than that in 1939 when uh, G.E. Moore was retiring from Cambridge. She was a front runner for the, the chair of philosophy at Cambridge and in fact had a lot of support for that. Um, but also I fear quite a lot of um, opposition as well, some of it quite clearly and straightforwardly motivated by sexism. Uh, Stebbing didn't get the chair, it in fact went to Wittgenstein. Um, and uh, as a result, as I say, Stebbing stayed um, at Bedford the rest of her career. Uh, Bedford College itself was actually evacuated to Cambridge um, in, at the start of the war. So Stebbing spent the last few years of her life teaching Bedford students, but in borrowed Cambridge rooms. Um, she also, in those last few years, uh, was very active in the um, financial and the, and the practical assistance of refugees from, from Central Europe. Um, and um, that fed in ways that we'll perhaps talk about in, in a little while into her, her more political work as well. Um, in, her 19, in, in her 50s, uh, Stebbing was diagnosed with cancer. It seemed to go into remission, but returned a very soon and very vehemently, uh, and uh, Stebbing died in a London hospital in 1943, just a few months before her 58th birthday. So that's the context that we'll be working within. It's 19, uh, 1885 to 1943. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so this kind of, you've mentioned the war obviously being a kind of important uh, historical context for thinking about perhaps especially her public philosophy. Mm. This was one of the other kind of historical arcs that it might be nice to visit is the, the sort of arc of analytic philosophy, which is sort of one lens against which she's sort of regarded. Um, for those of us who haven't had analytic philosophical training, um, Mike, would you mind telling us a bit about analytic philosophy and some of its main ideas? Sure. Um, so one normally uh, regards analytic philosophy as originating in the work of uh, Gottlob Frege, who's the founder of modern logic, modern quantification logic, which offered a far more powerful tool to analyze propositions, which hadn't been able to be analyzed in traditional logic. Bertrand Russell, who some of you may well have heard of, who developed some of Frege's ideas, and G. E. Moore, who was a major influence on stepping together with Wittgenstein. Those are often seen as the, the four uh, founding fathers of analytic philosophy, though, as perhaps I might say later, 
uh, Stebbing, I think, played a crucial role in that. We can we can discuss that. So what's crucial in the development of analytic philosophy is the um, use of logic. Now, one might ask, well, what is analytic philosophy? One would say it's obviously philosophy that's concerned with analysis. And then comes the obvious objection that analysis has always been a part of philosophy right from the ancient Greeks. So what is it that's distinctive about analytic philosophy? Now, what I see as, as distinctive is the role played by logic, the new logic that Frege and Russell developed. And um, in my, my own work, I've sort of um, developed or uh, tried to articulate uh, a, a concept of analysis that I think is quite important to make sense of analytic philosophy that isn't how one might normally understand analysis, which is simply decomposition, breaking something down into its parts. And there's an older notion of analysis that goes back to the ancient Greek notion that was used in Euclidean geometry, where analysis means going back to principles by means of which you, you prove something. So the first I call de decomposition, the second regressive. But I think there's a third notion that's also implicit in analysis, but comes to the fore in analytic philosophy, and that's what I call interpretive analysis. And what happens there is that you try to reconceptualize, interpret a problematic proposition in a new form, typically by using the resources of logic in order to solve certain kinds of kinds of problems. So, I mean, I think the best way to uh, explain what analytic philosophy means, what analytic and analytic philosophy means, is to think of it by analogy with analytic geometry. So now we distinguish analytic geometry from synthetic or Euclidean geometry, as, it, as it's called. And what's characteristic of analytic geometry is that you translate traditional problems of geometry into the language of algebra and arithmetic. Now, it happens that in traditional uh, Euclidean geometry, there are certain problems you simply can't solve by using your you know, rule and compass method. There's just certain kinds of constructions you, you can't make. And, and what um, Descartes and Feynman and others at the dawn of the early modern period ma managed to do was to translate those problems, traditional geometrical problems, into the language of arithmetic and, al and, and algebra. And that gave them a more powerful tool to solve the problems, and then you can translate back again. So I think one should see analytic philosophy as similar to analytic geometry, but where logic, if you like, replaces the arithmetic and analysis. So you have ordinary language, if you have a rich enough, more sophisticated logic by means of which to formalize and interpret the ordinary language propositions, you can make some headway in terms of analyzing it. So that I, I would say is what's distinctive of analytic philosophy. It's the use of interpretive analysis drawing on the resources of modern logic, quantification logic. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and you have suggested that we might see one of Susan Stebbing's works as the first textbook in analytic philosophy. So what, what how do you how do you see that? Yeah, no, I mean, here, here it is, a big fat, big fat book, 1930, it, it appeared. Um, it's actually called a modern introduction to, to logic. And I think that's significant. It's not an introduction to modern logic. What's characteristic, I think, of her work is that she actually drew on traditional logic whilst at the same time trying to introduce modern uh, you know, modern logic, the logic of Frege and Russell. So um, th this is why I, I, I say that you know, when one takes a, a kind of broader view of the development of, of analytic philosophy, then Stebbing actually has a really, really crucial role. Not so many people would read more and maybe a bit more Russell and, and Wittgenstein, but they certainly read um, uh, Susan Stebbing. And this was a major work in the 1930s. It covered all the topics that we normally associate traditionally with logic, the kind of thing one has in J.S. Mill's logic, for example, concerned with deduction and induction and so on. It introduces you to traditional Aristotelian logic, syllogistic so theory and so on. But at the same time, through that, and, and, and Sebbing specifically says she thinks that the theory of the syllogism is a little bit easier to grasp, that the basic ideas of logic, what validity is, for example, what it is to be um, a valid in virtue of logical form and so on. So there's a good way to introduce logic, but at the same time, you need to show that they're far more sophisticated techniques and concerns with all sorts of other things that were introduced by, by Frege and Russell. And that's what she does in that book. And that was enormously influential. That was a second edition in 1933. She doesn't use the word analytic philosophy in it. That's a word actually that only comes, comes in later. But I think one, one could justifiably say that was the textbook that really certainly as far as um, uh, making analytic philosophy um, uh, popular or explaining analytic philosophy to a, to a broad audience, um, very important in, in the UK, it was served as a, as a textbook to introduce students to, to this area of philosophy. So in that respect, I think she was really, really important. And her, uh, the rest of her work, I think, follows that same line. 
it's interesting to see that maybe the the, the sort of experience as a as a teacher um, finds its way into her work and a way of offering people different roads into logic, whether it's through Aristotelian's logistic or more contemporary stuff. It seems like the you know there's there's a mind of somebody in education there at work. Um, just I returning just, to sorry, Claire, just to pick up on that, I think that's absolutely right. I think it's characteristic of Debbie's career that she was an active teacher throughout, and in fact, a very a very busy uh, teacher. She had a very full time teaching timetable throughout, and and remained. Uh, committed to that despite the success of some of the works that we're talking about this evening so I think her teaching was was as important to her really as, as her as her writing I guess um, to maybe get a, a start on thinking about her ideas and language and one that maybe relates to her experience in the classroom as well and thinking about things more practically um, she seems to have been interested in natural language uh, as well as the kind of more formal version of things that we get in in logic and maybe philosophy of language nowadays um, Shiva one, why was that and what impact did it have on the way she thought? Yeah, I mean, Stebbing had um, a, a recurring theme in her work, really. It dates back to a modern introduction to logic, which Mike has just been talking about. It continues and in many ways intensifies um, for the rest of her career, is um, an appeal to the importance of close attention to the ways in which language is actually used in, in ordinary um, uh, communicative situations. Um, this was unusual at the time. It would be um, simplistic to say that no other philosophers or no other analytic philosophers were, were paying attention to natural language, but certainly there was a tendency in the analytic tradition that Mike's just been talking about to see natural language as in some way a bit messy, a bit imperfect compared with the rigors of, of logical um, logical language and somehow likely to, to mislead or to... Um, to obscure uh, arguments and something that philosophers should be be careful of really. Stebbing I think was unusual and, and this is as I say throughout her philosophical career in her insistence uh, not just on acknowledging that there are differences between logical and, and natural language but actually um, her insistence on paying careful attention to what those differences are, how we might explain them and really seeing the, the meanings that come across in natural language is something that could be discussed systematically uh, rather than something to be dismissed as, 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 as vague and, and, and impenetrable. And I think you're quite right, Claire, that in that she does sort of take on some of the views that are now very much commonplace in modern linguistics, but were, were very you know, unusual at the time. That's interesting to see, you know, in this one thinker, the combination of the sort of sensitivity Mike was talking about to the ability to translate philosophical problems into this kind of new formal language, but then at the same time, uh, you know, an awareness that the way people communicate is in natural language, and if we want to say things about logic that permeate, you know, the public sphere, maybe we'll need to talk about that kind of speech too. So um, the Ordinary Language School of Philosophy and Linguistics maybe was a, a sort of uh, a thing that came shortly after her period, do you see her as a sort of forerunner to that or how do you see the connections there? Yes, it's interesting. If you say ordinary language philosophy to most philosophers, philosophers they'll probably not think of stepping. They'll probably think of work that was being done at, at Oxford. They'll probably think about the years kind of immediately following the, the Second World War. And names like J.L. Austin, Peter Strawson and so on are particularly um, sort of uh, representative of that school of thought. There are similarities there, certainly. Um, both Stebbing and the so-called philosophers of ordinary language insisted on close attention to the ways in which we use language. I think potentially, at least for the ordinary language philosophers, it became more of a, a methodology or an end in its own right, as it were. J. L. Austin, for instance, uh, spent uh, or, or argued that philosophers, before they could get down to the business of doing any philosophy at all, had to get very, very clear about the terms they were using, had to think intuitively about how they might use terms in different contexts and what different shades of meanings that would give them. Whereas Stebbing, I think, was more concerned with what we might call the practicalities of doing that, being clear about what words mean, being clear perhaps about ways in which context can affect and give different shades to meaning, but then getting on and applying that, getting on and looking at possible um, errors that people were, were falling into or possible ways in which philosophical discussion might depart from ordinary discussion. Okay, so 
it might be nice at this point to try and think a little bit about her as a public philosopher so that we can try and keep that thread alongside some of the more technical stuff. So, Peter, it's really nice to be doing a public philosophy event and finally get to talk about a philosopher who did a lot of public philosophy. So can you tell us a little bit about Stebbing's role as a public philosopher and how that came about or what she said? Yeah, it is. It's great to be doing public philosophy about public philosophy. Um, I mean, I was just going to say, just, just to add to, to what Mike and Siobhan have said already. So it's maybe just worth saying, uh, Stebbing was also kind of a prolific worker within academic philosophy. So she published really widely. She was the president of the Mind Association and the Aristotelian Asso Association, which are kind of the two biggest UK-based uh, philosophy societies. So she kind of had these credentials within the, the, the academy. But then in the 30s and the 40s, her work starts to turn towards this more popular audience. So, I mean, for the record, you know, I, I, the reason I got into Stebbing is not because of the big books on logic. It's because of books like these, these little penguin books that are supposed to fit in your jacket pocket and be read um, on the bus. So, so, I mean, it's just a testament, I think, to, to the wide ranging interests that she had and, and also the wide ranging Sort of abilities to, to write philosophy for different audiences. It's sort of I mean, hard to imagine when she slept between this commitment to the school project, the societies, the lectureships, professorships. I mean, it seems just like an amazing breadth of things to be working on all at once. Yeah, exactly. And, and also sort of, I mean, a wide range of expertise as well. So, I mean, one of her popular texts, Philosophy and the Physicists, is sort of this critique of the popular scientific writings of the early 20th century. Um, and she frequently sort of describes herself as, 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 an, as incompetent in understanding this stuff and so on, and as an as a amateur. But, but when you read the text, you realize she's really got a good sense of it. And, and that's demonstrated in the fact that she's able to articulate these ideas very clearly. Um, the other text that, that, that kind of comes out of this period, or at least an, another text that comes out of this period, and, and the first of her texts to be published with um, the Pelican imprint that, that, that was published by Penguin, um, is thinking to some purpose. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's mentioned it already, but that, that I mean, just anecdotally, in, in my experience, if, if people have heard of Stebbing, oh, there you go. Yeah, I don't have mine to hand, so I had to show <laughs> you. Mug. <laughs> Sorry, for the podcast, uh, Mike Beanie has just produced a Thinking to Some Purpose mug. So we're, it's, we're it's my, my, I have to say, it's my favourite mug, Thinking to Some Purpose. So Penguin issued a number of these mugs marking the, the, the publication of some of the most popular books. And Susan Stebbing, I saw it on King's Cross Station one day, I was completely gobsmacked. There was Susan Stebbing's mug there, so of course I had to buy it. So yeah, that shows how popular the book was at the time, this Thinking wow. to Some Purpose. There we are. Get the mug. Wonderful. <laughs> You're, you're going to have to tell me where you got that, Mike. Um, <laughs> King's so, I mean, Cross Station, but whether it's still there, they still sell them, I don't know. So, so I love thinking to some purpose. I think it's a really accessible text. I think that it's, as a, as a book, it's a really good answer to the question, which as philosophers we get really used to, which is, why should you study philosophy? I think that if, if I were going to point anyone to one text in, in answer to that question, it would be this one. So... It's described, it's written in 1939. It's, it's a year before the, the dawn of the Second World War. Um, and it's described in the, the original Pelican version as a manual to first aid in clear thinking, which I think is really interesting because there's kind of three things going on there. It's a manual. So like a car driver's manual, it's going to explain to us how to do something. And then the first aid part is interesting because it's also in learning to do whatever it is we're going to learn to do something. We're going to learn to fix something or to heal something. And the thing that we're going to learn to do is, is to think clearly, which is which or to think to some purpose, which is kind of the well, where the title of the text comes from. So, yeah, it's, I mean, so so it's written, at, at, as I said, at the dawn of the Second World War. And, and Stebbing really thinks that getting a getting a wide readership equipped with the tools of philosophical thinking of, of simple logic um, simple learning how to, 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 in, to make the right inferences and spot the right kind of fallacies she literally thinks it will, will help us save democracy so I think it's a, a really interesting philosophical text for that reason 
we're definitely going to probe Mike a little bit about some of the sort of thinking on fallacies she does in a, in a few minutes. But I'm just wondering, were there many other people doing public philosophy at this time? And, and if so, how did her kind of output compare to them? Or, you know, were there sort of salient contrasts there? So, that, so there were other people doing pu public philosophy. So, so Mike mentioned um, Bertrand Russell already, who was and probably still is sort of a, a household name. Um, and and this, Russell has this, this essay that he wrote in 1946 called Philosophy for Layman, where he explains what he thinks the benefits of doing public philosophy are. And he kind of has, he argues, you know, doing philosophy will, will help you as an individual to accrue virtues um, and to live the right kind of life. So he's going right back to the Aristot Aristotelian idea of, of living a good life by being, being a wise person. Um, and I think, so what's different between, different from, from the difference between Russell and Stebbing is I think Russell's really giving off the idea that, that doing philosophy is an end in itself. It's sort of, it's something that's worth doing because it's, it's, a, it's intrinsically good in itself. Whereas I think what's, what's quite different from that is in Stebbing, uh, doing philosophy, thinking clearly is always a means towards some other end. I mean, going back to the title of that, that popular text, it's all thinking for Stebbing is thinking to some purpose. So that to me seems like a, a key difference between the two of them. So she's perhaps a little bit less idealistic about philosophy and maybe a bit more pragmatic. Can I just come in there as well? I think I totally agree with what Peter's just been saying. And I think I've got another difference in mind between Stebbing and some of the other uh, public philosophers at the time. And, and there were at the time as well in, in the 30s, uh, quite a lot of books that were addressing uh, issues to do with um, what we would now call critical thinking, to addressing issues to do with, um, you know, spotting uh, fallacies and so on. But what really stands out for me about thinking to some uh, thinking to some purpose is that it is packed with real life examples. It's absolutely full of examples that Stebbing has found um, uses of language, particularly by those with some sort of actual or assumed uh, authority. Um, there are extracts there from political speeches, from advertising slogans, from newspaper editorials, from published sermons and so on. And what Stemming's doing there is really using the sorts of techniques that Peter's been talking about and using the sorts of tools for analysis um, that, that she's developed in her, uh, in her logical career to, to really look at what's going on in those actual real life texts. And that again, to me, gives it a really modern present day kind of flavor. Again, yeah, I feel like you can see the benefit of the kind of the teacher element again in, in providing this kind of interesting way to get across to a broader audience, you know, why using examples, things are, things are important. Peter Stubbing actually said, I'll, 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 I'll let somebody else in in a minute, but Stowing actually suggested uh, that a way to teach students to think it critically and to analyse arguments that were put to them would be to take different newspaper articles, uh, articles from different newspapers reporting the same story and to compare the ways in which that story was told. Now that's something that we actually do nowadays in, in, in linguistic analysis, but uh, you know, I, I, that was the first I'd heard of anyone suggesting it, and that was back in the 1930s. So. Brilliant idea. Peter? I, I was just gonna add, yeah, I think that's, that's really sort of one of the um, sort of striking features of thinking to some purpose. And it's, I think what's interesting is, is as a text, it makes it, it's kind of a weird combination of being both a historical artifact in the sense that the examples used are very specific to the 1930s. Um, I mean, so for example, maybe we'll talk about this at some point, but she has this idea that when you're engaging in political discourse, you should look out for something that she calls potted thinking, which is sort of the use of empty slogans, which you know might, you might think is still going on in politics today. Um, <laughs> but, the, but the metaphor comes from potted meat, which is this, this sort of thing you might have found in a ration pack. Um, so it's both this kind of these universal messages. I mean, I really do think it's, it's a text that is as relevant today as it was when it's written, but packaged in these sort of interesting more historical, with these historical metaphors, for example. Um, okay. I mean, if, if I can add one thing, I mean, if you did pick up this book and read it today, although, as Peter says, the examples, of course, are drawn from the 1930s as fascism was on, on the rise, you can't help thinking, my God, 
have we really improved from this? You think of all sorts of things that our politicians say. I mean, I kept thinking, one would think of the arguments, really bad arguments, fallacious arguments that are going on with regard to Brexit. The, the, the actual book um, begins with a prologue entitled, Are the English Illogical? I'm sure the Scots and the Welsh will be pleased. Yes, it's really only the English that are, that are illogical as far as Brexit is concerned. But you know, and and that frames the the book in a way that 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 issue about about you know we do make lots of fallacies. We say we also have a mistaken conception of what logic is. So she kind of opposes a sort of British view of the importance of common sense, often rather confusingly um, uh, characterized, to get uh, in, in in opposition to the French, who sort of to have very abstract principles and just think think them through very logically and come out with most absurd uh, views. So she, she she kind of opposes two different views, both of which I think in, in many ways are a misconception of what logic is. And then she gives you a, a far more reasonable conception of the use of logic. And I think that's that's a really good way of framing uh, framing the book. And then, as Peter and Chauvin says, there's lots of wonderful examples that that um, you know sh show the ways in which we think um, badly. Potted thinking, using analogies and metaphors, and 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 lots of other things. Just before I ask Mike a bit more about <laughs> stepping on logic, I would just like to remind people that they can ask questions. So either using Facebook or the Zoom Q and A, um, fire away. Um, so Mike, she published topics in logic. Um, we think about well, those of us who've done philosophy, I suppose, think about logic as a very specific kind of thing. Uh, and obviously it played a quite specific role in the analytic philosophy you've described. Can you tell us a bit about her contributions on that front and maybe how she stands out as somebody thinking about logic in that era? Um, so, so I suppose there's two things if we've got time for both. One is the way in which she offers analyses of, of propositions to show, I and mean, this is the sort of real sort of hardcore philosophy, if you like, and, and some of the, the um, assumptions that come out of that. So, I mean, here's the example. I mean, this is taken from my, my very short in, introduction to analytic philosophy, where I have a chapter on, on stepping alongside Frege, Russell, Moore, and Wittgenstein, the usual culprits, but I think it's important to, to recognise Stebbing's role um, because of the, the textbook. And, and the example I, I use, which I think is a good example to indicate the kind of thing that goes on in analytic philosophy, and, and Stebbing was concerned with, let's, let's take this, this proposition, which we might say, let's assume it's true. The average British woman has 1.9 children. Okay, the average British woman has 1.9 children. Let's, let's assume that that's, that's true. And we seek to analyze it, to go back to my distinction between decomposition and interpreter, you know, we, we sort of decompose it. Well, what is the average British woman? Let's see if we can find out who she is. Uh, and we can, if we can find out who she is, then we can ask whether this person has 1.9 children. Now that's clearly absurd, right? There's no, there's no such person as the average British woman. And yet we understand what's meant by the sentence. So, so the, the, the proposition calls out for analysis. And, and clearly in this case, it's a, a, a straightforward example. One would say the analysis of that is if you add up the total number of children of British woman, women and divide by the total number of women, you'll get the answer 1.9. So in other words, the talk of the average British woman is just an abbreviation for talking about all the British women there and all their children. Okay, so this is an example where, if you like, the surface form of a sentence could easily mislead us. And you know, we 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 go into the world and see if we can find the average British woman. You know, there's no such such person, and even if there were, they couldn't have 1.9 children. But we understand what's meant, and what's meant is that it actually is. And this is um, Stebbing talks about indirect reference is actually, if you like, implicitly referring to all the women and all their children in, in, in Britain at the time. So that the statement is just an abbreviation of a more complex statement. And what you're doing in analysis is you're trying to unpack the original statement in order to make clear what you're really committed to when you say such a thing. So what we're committed to, if you like, when we say the average British woman has 1.9 children. It's not the existence of an average British woman, but the existence of all the women and all their children that there are in Britain. And then one is, one's asserting a relationship between them. So here we have the idea of directional analysis, which is then, I think, also gives rise to her concern with purpose, you know, purpose of uh, analysis. What we do when we uh, analyze something is we're trying to find out the, the, this was a word she used in the early 30s before she began to be a bit more critical of the notion. We're trying to uncover the basic facts that underlie a particular claim. So we have a claim about the average British woman and the, that rests on there being certain basic facts, namely there being women in Britain who have a certain number of children. Okay, so that, that's the idea. So analysis is essentially a way of going from a, uh, 
uh, a simple uh, sentence to a sentence that somehow displays more overtly, more explicitly, what you, as it were, to, to use the philosophical jargon, you're ontologically committed to. And that, that's the kind of thing. So metaphysical analysis or directional analysis is an attempt to uncover the basic form of, um, of reality, the basic facts that underlie a particular claim. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking about how this kind of that kind of analysis might play a role in her view on the on the public sphere. So it seems like she thinks that this kind of clear thinking, this taking propositions and trying to figure out what motivates their utterance in the first place, for example, or to understand their linguistic context a bit better. Um, how did this kind of thinking, how did she see it playing a role in, in healthy democracy? I was going to ask this to Peter, but I'm sure all of you have thoughts on it. So please. Yeah. So so, I mean, I think I think it's something that underlies especially her later work. I mean, the, the phrase clear thinking or thinking clearly comes up a lot. So it's something that Stebbing thinks is, is really important. Um, and I think so, so, I mean, going back to this idea of, of thinking to some purpose, for example, as a manual, um, something that I think kind of is unique about her approach to doing philosophy in the public sphere is an emphasis on the extent to which public philosophy is a two-way street. So it's not just about communicating information to an audience, but it's equipping them with the tools, for example, to, to be able to hold those in public office to account. So I talked about one of the examples, which was this, this idea of keeping an eye out for potted thinking. Um, Another, another example is, um, and this also relates to what I think what Siobhan was saying earlier and, and the relationship between studying and, and discussions of natural language. I think another way in that she's quite prescient is, so one of the kind of lessons in thinking to some purpose is uh, we should be wary of what she calls emotive language. So she draws this distinction between what she calls scientific language and emotive language. So scientific language is, uh, and obviously we're in a, we're all philosophers, so you might question whether there is such a thing, but scientific language is language that just describes things objectively, whereas emotive language is language that's designed to or will Im provoke some emotional response in, in a hearer or a reader. And basically Stebbing's point is that lots of language we see in, in, in say, political speeches in newspapers purports to be scientific it's just telling us facts but in fact is is emotive language um so that's so, so she talks about this idea of there certain words she says have tied suggestions so the example that she uses is um newspaper articles refer to the doll instead of something more something more sort of clinical like unemployment benefit um i mean i i was thinking about this recently i think a word that you might apply this to in in today's political public discourse is something like woke right which if you describe someone as woke it purports to certain just simply pick out some features of the way they go about thinking about the world but it's often very kind of meant to design to make you feel a certain way so that's just one way in which Stebbing thinks being able to think clearly i.e think in the right kind of way can help us preserve the the, the democratic society that we have currently can I, can I maybe offer an example that picks up exactly on what Peter's been saying there about the Please. emotive language and the inappropriately emotive use of language? One of the main targets for um, Stebbing's analysis is uh, Stanley Baldwin. There are a lot of examples from speeches by Stanley Baldwin, uh, the many times uh, Conservative uh, Prime Minister. And um, I've just got a note here of um, a speech from Baldwin that she quotes in Thinking to Some Purpose, in which he, he argues this was a speech in 1931 when he was running for election. He says, in this country of ours, there are tens of millions of quiet, decent folk. We are bound to think of them and no decent man can help thinking of them. And on he goes and on he goes. And Stebbing points out uh, that what he's doing here is um, appealing to, to fellow, sorry, appealing to feelings of fellowship and sympathy with quiet people made more effective by the use of this country of ours and decent folk. Her point being that these are simply emotive words. They're not actually um, 
adding to the argument or presenting anything to do with Baldwin's policies. And she takes it, she calls him out for this repeatedly in thinking of some purpose. Okay. Can I also just draw a link between what I said is in, in, in what she does in analysis, you know, interpreting a problematic sentence to what Peter mentioned is an important theme in thinking to some purpose, this idea of potted thinking. Okay, so to make that connection, you could say that the statement, the average British woman has 1.9 children, is a, is a potted statement, right? You need to unpack it to understand what's going on. So in a way, what she's doing in her book is just an extension of that idea that, that, that is important to analytic philosophy, that we take a, a short sentence, an abbreviation, and we need to understand what's really going on. Now, this might be a more controversial example, but it's the kind of thing that Stebbing talks about. We might make reference to the English or the nation or the government, and we make claims about the government does this or whatever it might be. But that would be a kind of form of potted thinking, because it's not that there's a single coherent entity, certainly not in present time in Britain, you know, but the English government, the British government. I mean, there's a whole host of different people doing different kinds of things. And it's very easy to assume that we have a single term for something. There must be some in single entity that's somehow coherent, and it might not be the case. So that when we actually analyse you know, a statement, a, a policy that the government puts forward, we might see that it actually hides an all, a number of rather different, often contradictory, incoherent um, policies. So what we're doing as political analysts would be to try and unpack the statements that, that government ministers make in order to, to understand you know, at a deeper level what's going on. So I think that's really just an extension in the political sphere, the kind of thing she was doing, if you like, in, in, in her uh, more philosophical, logical, metaphysical work. Fascinating. Yeah, add, uh, just a, another example of potted thinking since since we're talking, and something that's come up already, I and one that I think is really important when we're talking about stepping is common sense, is references to common sense. I mean, common sense philosophy, one of its heydays is this period of time, particularly in the work of, of G.E. Moore, who's, who Stebbing frequently acknowledges as an influence on her work. But I think that quite reasonably Stebbing maybe more than someone like Moore, is aware that common sense is a concept that needs unpacking. I mean, and, and, and again, this is something that, you know, throughout the pandemic in this country, particularly, we've seen lots of appeals to common sense, that common sense is the crutch we can rely on when we're not sure what to do and so on. But I think that the stepping might have this, you know, might reasonably worry that that concept is not unpacked, that pop, that thought is not taken out of its pot frequently enough and it's gone stale right because so anyway so that's just a, just to add to, to what mike was saying well i think that's another one that comes up a lot in, in especially in that chapter at the beginning of thinking to some purpose where she's really taking to account people like stanley baldwin for contrasting common sense with logical thinking and abstract reasoning but you know it might actually be the case that when you unpack common sense it just is logical reasoning, especially given that, that for Stebbing thinks we all have this innate ability to think logically. So if anything is common to us, it's that. Well, I think it seems appropriate in the spirit of, of Stebbing to give lots of examples, given that, you know, that was her way of getting ideas across. Um, it's interesting as well, this thread of common sense philosophy, since in the history of philosophy, it's been used variously and hilariously by people as a kind of primer for presenting their own ideas. You know, this is just common sense. This is what everybody thinks. And then saying a thing nobody thinks, but it's as if it can play this kind of warm up role in providing, you know, a sympathetic context for what you're about to say. Um, Mike, so can you tell us a bit more about purposive or directed thinking in Stebbing's, Stebbing's sort of work on critical thinking? Uh, well, I, I suppose um, I, I briefly mentioned in, in terms of this idea of interpretive thinking so it comes out of that concern with trying to um, uncover what a particular proposition that you might make in an abbreviated form a kind of potted thinking really commits you to so that's one thing that i think is is um, um in, in involved here the the other thing i think is is just recognizing that um when we um, use reasoning, it, it is with a particular purpose. We're, we're, we're trying to solve some practical problem that, that faces us at the time. So actually, the um, um, modern introduction to logic opens with this, this, this example of someone being on the beach, and then the tide's coming in, and someone shouts, look out, okay? And suddenly, the person on the beach realizes that, you know, they're below the the line where the 
the the sea is going to rise if it reaches high tide and that they, they better do something if they're not going not going to drown and they see a line in the the, the rocks which they interpret as the high water level they realize there's a ledge above that and they think that therefore they should climb to that level and rest there so they don't get drowned so this is an example where one might say you have to engage in a certain form of reasoning but based on certain as if you like in this case empirical assumptions the tide is about to come on come in there's a rock above the high water line uh, therefore if i want to uh, not be drowned then i need to um, uh, move to that higher point so this is an example where you've got empirical assumptions grounded in a particular problem that's facing you and then you're using um, logic in order to reason to some some end namely i must i must move to the to the high point if i don't want to be drowned so that's that i think is uh, an example of what she means by purpose of thinking it always has to be rooted in concerns that we have but to do it effectively we have to respect or follow um the laws of logic and one thing that we can do as logicians as philosophers she would say is to make explicit what is implicit in our reasoning practices and make people realize that this is how they should act and so the other thing that i'd say is quite important in in her work is this conception which is also um uh, um throughout the late 19th century especially in analytic philosophy this idea that logic as it's sometimes put as an, in an abbreviated form, normative rather than descriptive. The laws okay, of logic. Can you, can you explain those? Yeah. Things? Um, in other words, uh, when we formulate the laws of logic, they're not just descriptive of how we actually think, they're actually stating how we should think. In other words, they're prescriptive. Okay. And here's where I, I think it's important to recognize that even if we make fallacies in everyday life, we can be brought to recognize that they're fallacies. In other words, if we simply you know, ask someone a, a certain logical question, I mean, there's there's some good examples. That in, in my, again, in my little, very short introduction, I take the case of the ways on selection tests to suggest that there are all sorts of little tests, little logical um, uh, problems that one can ask people to resolve. Often they can get them wrong first time round. So you can't rely on, as it were, just taking a, a sort of survey of what people actually think in order to get at the laws of logic. Okay, you've got to recognize that sometimes people get things wrong. But what's important is that if they get them wrong, they can be brought to see why they're wrong. And that's why Stebbing writes these books in order to help people to realize how these fallacies arise and how to correct them and to recognize the, the logical rules that are actually in place. So that's why I say, and, and Stebbing agrees, that the logic is, is normative. And that's why there's a task for the logician, for the philosopher, to help us uh, recognize what the logical rules are in order for it to help us in, in purpose of thinking. Okay, so it seems like maybe that she has a sort of optimism about how people can, with practice or with the right kind of example-based learning, become better at interrogating things in a way that's helpful? Yeah, okay. you could say it's optimistic. I'd say something deeper, that it's grounded in basic abilities that most of us do in fact have, if we can only be brought to to um, to see it. So, but yeah, you could say it's optimism if you like. Yeah, and I, I think <laughs> Stephanie also saw that task of bringing that to the fore as increasingly urgent, didn't she? Yeah. That, you know, that, that as the way that the political situation, the social situation was going in the 30s, she felt uh, almost like a calling to 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 help people to 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 use those abilities to 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 spot the fallacies and so on. Whereas before, she was perhaps uh, more content to sort of stay behind the scenes and to stay in her in her university appointments and so on. But I think she she felt kind of called to to take a more public role because. Of Can the you say a bit more about that, Siobhan? I'm just wondering: is that you know the power of language is obviously an important theme for her, but do we see you know really? big evidential marks of a kind of urgency around the politics of the time in, in the work there? Well, I think, I mean, Peter talked earlier about the, the kind of framework in which uh, Thinking to Some Purpose is, is published. It was, I think, originally intended to be a series of lectures that Stebbing would give on the, on the BBC. So, you know, a very public facing uh, sort of set of presentations. The, the lectures themselves didn't happen, I think, because of various health issues that, that Stebbing was uh, experiencing at the time. But it was um, a very early, uh, very pioneering volume in the, uh, the Pelican uh, popular uh, series. Um, and I think, um, Peter, if you, have you got it right there? Because I think there's something in the blurb about the urgent need there's, for- There's a good quote I have in yeah, front of me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, 
I'm convinced of the urgent need for a democratic people to think clearly without the distortions due to unconscious bias and unrecognized ignorance. I can continue. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, uh, a it's, more, mission, it's a brilliant mission statement, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. And then she says it's the aim of this book to make a small effort in this direction towards uh, and towards identifying and overcoming um, failures in our thinking. So I can see the obvious desire to bring clarity in such fraught political times. Why were the scientists or the popular scientists of the day also such a target? That one is harder for me as a non-expert to see. So she published Philosophy and the Physicists. What, what's the main agenda there? Yeah, that is a good question. That's Philosophy and the Physicists. Um, so yeah, I, 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 something I've thought about is, is how to connect up the, the mission in thinking to some purpose, which is very wide ranging, which isn't really specific to any particular domain of discourse, and which has this urgency about it, to philosophy and the physicists, which is essentially a critique of two scientists. Um, so so the, the two people in, in question are Sir, Sir James Jeans uh, and Sir Arthur Eddington, who, who basically were the sort of Professor Brian Cox or the Bill Nye of the 1920s Britain. Um, Eddington in particular was famous for popularizing Einsteinian physics and bringing that to... to. So her, her critique is basically that these, these two popular scientific writers, she, she says that, you know, there's a lot of responsibility on their hands because we don't all have the time and effort and maybe the ability to go out and learn theoretical physics or learn you know about Einsteinian physics so it's on their shoulders to explain to us this this fundamental stuff about the world around us and then she basically thinks they, they really don't do a very good job of taking on board that responsibility um, the two criticisms she has particularly are they sort of have this gratuitous use of metaphor and personification so particularly she she gets very frustrated by the fact that they keep, even when they say things like, um, you know, nature, they, they say things like nature isn't, it shouldn't be anthropomorphized. And then later they'll say things like, nature selected this or that for this reason and so on. And then the other thing she gets very kind of, that she's very critical of is both of them have these, these big, these, these texts that were widely read. Jeans is also published in the Pelican series. So it's kind of interesting that they, they can go alongside one another. Um, and both of them have a final chapter where they start doing philosophy and they say, you know, modern physics gives us an argument for the existence of God and modern physics, both of them think, gives us an argument um, for, for idealism, which is this view, which has a long history in philosophy. Um, broadly speaking, the view that reality is mental that everything exists in the mind of something, which, which is a view that Stebbing and Russell and Moore were all sort of starkly opposed to. And so she kind of just thinks that they're really bad philosophers as well. Um, I don't, I'm still, I'm, you know, in terms of the question of why that, or if that is as urgent an issue as, as something like what's going on in thinking to put some purpose, I'm not sure, but I think that you can see at least that she has this claim that there's a lot of responsibility and they're just not doing a very good job of following through with that. And it relates to her interest in how we use language as well, because part of the responsibility that Peter's talked about, that, that Stebbing felt they were misusing, was in their tendency to use um, ordinary natural language as if it could explain the very technical um, innovations of, of contemporary science. Uh, so, for instance, um, Eddington has this very kind of dramatic way of describing the, the physical universe, uh, which is made up of um, electric particles flying around in space. Um, but he, instead of sort of trying to explain it in a scientific way, he says things like, I'm stepping onto a plank, but it has no solidity. How do I know I'm not going to fall through it? And Stebbing takes issue with this. She, she basically does a kind of ordinary language philosophy move on this and says, well, if a, pl if a plank isn't solid, what on earth does solid mean? Because surely solid is having the, the properties of a plank, a marble surface, and so on. So she actually sees it as quite dangerous that Ed, that Eddington is, in a way, trying to trying to scare people. Um, I think she would put it as strongly as that by using apparently ordinary terms to describe um, understandings of the world which are scientific and are not ordinary. We're not just about to sink through the floor because it's made up of, of particles, but Eddington would perhaps 
mislead his readership into thinking that we might. Okay, so there's a real worry about trying to make things understandable or digestible and that having the unfortunate consequence of really distorting the meaning of things in a, in a damaging way. And possibly for a particular motivation. I mean, Peter talks about the, the notion of the kind of the proof of, of the deity and so on. You know, that I think Stebbing saw a very clear uh, agenda behind all this. Okay. Mike, do you have any thoughts on the on the physicist stuff or? No, I agree with what Peter and, and Siobhan says. I mean, I think one can see what's happening here as an application of a very Morian view about, about philosophy here that um, uh, apply to things that yeah, physicists say. I mean, it, this is tricky ground today. I mean, on the one hand, we want to respect the views of, of scientists, say, with the pandemic. On the other hand, there is this tendency of uh, physicists or scientists generally to to take a step beyond and start drawing philosophical con conclusions from those which don't necessarily follow from what they're saying or well, as Siobhan said to try and perhaps reconceptualize those things in, in in ordinary language and hence running the risk of being being misleading and I think that the message is very clear all of us have to be alert both to the benefits but also to the potential you know dangers of, of scientists speaking if you like outside their expertise or drawing philosophical conclusions from but as I say obviously in this pandemic it's quite it's quite dangerous because I think there's been a tendency just to assume that you know scientists yeah are saying things they shouldn't anyway and we should be more skeptical than perhaps we should, we, we should be at the present time so it's a fine line to draw here but I think she was certainly concerned to 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 reject some of the more extreme things that scientists do but more by way of drawing philosophical conclusions from from scientific uh, ideas yeah I, th I think something that she finds particularly frustrating and related to what 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 you're saying Mike about you know, that maybe, you know, you don't want to draw too many limits on what scientists can say. But I think what she finds frustrating with these particular writers is they both acknowledge they don't have any philosophical training and that there is a limit to what a scientist should say. And then they say it anyway, and they sort of make it the whole crux of their, their piece of writing. So I think maybe that's to some extent where, where she might draw the line. OK, so maybe she's giving us the tools to sort of interrogate what are legitimate inferences from, you know, people who are ultimately the right people maybe to express the data or the, the facts and then maybe to interrogate where people go beyond the evidence or into sort of more metaphysical considerations or something. Okay, so I have a few questions here and I might start with one from Dana um, and maybe Siobhan, I feel like I can see how this could relate to work you've done. But so uh, Dana says, can we use Stabbing's work as a way uh, to sort of deal with misinformation in, in media or social media? So, you know, translating her thinking to the to the very modern era i guess yes would be the answer there i mean i think there are there are tools which um stebbing offices in in work like thinking to some purpose and, and peter has alluded to this earlier which can be transferred across to um present day examples and uh, as peter said uh, in some ways thinking to some purpose seems quite quite dated the examples are all you know there are adverts there which are from the 1930s and in some ways they can seem quite amusing um but um some of the features that that Stelling picks up on for instance in the advertising slogans um the use of lots and lots of personal pronouns you want this we all do this they recommend this and she gets us to kind of she asks us to kind of unpick who's being referred to here what is it that we're being drawn into uh, and she sort of identifies a sense of an advertisement as something that sets up a problem that is going to be solved by the product on offer. And I think some of these things we can translate almost wholesale across into modern uh, across to modern texts. So that's a that's a yes, I think, to that one. Peter, do you have any thoughts on the sort of translation of these thoughts into into more contemporary models? Yeah. I mean, the striking thing when I was reading this, and not to go on about it, but with this idea of potted thinking. That sounds to me exactly like what a tweet is. Um, so I can't help reading that section of thinking to some purpose and thinking about Twitter. That you know, you 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 literally can't say very much, and but but the message spreads. And I suppose the same is true with any other social media platform as well. I guess her point would just be question these statements. Um, you know, find out if there's there's any kind of truth or you know nutrients in the potted meat or not okay i have a question specifically for michael <laughs> um is there any convergence between the thinking of stebbing and of wittgenstein on morian metaphysics specifically and metaphysics in general so 
yeah, can you say something about how her views on metaphysics might relate to the? To okay, the world? okay, this is quite this is quite tricky because um, I think Stebbing was influenced by Wittgenstein, um, but at a time when I mean the tract. I mean, we're, we're talking about Wittgenstein's Tractatus, the sort of key work that was published in 1921, that was hugely influential on Cambridge philosophy and and throughout the analytic tradition. And it was beginning to be discussed and 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 applied and and um, in in throughout Britain at the time. Um, it had, it had had a major influence on the the so-called logical positivists, the people of the Vienna Vienna Circle, who were very pro-science but but also very anti-metaphysical. Um, and I mean, so, so there's so many different components. It's, it's a matter of kind of juggling with all of them. But I mean, one thing that I think historically uh, Susan Stebbing did was that she was responsible for introducing logical positivism into Britain. To, to she, she invited Carnap and 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 some of the other logical positivists to speak in in Britain. Um, uh, uh, AJ Eyre was then the, the spokesperson of um, logic positivism in, in Britain, and Stebbing was also quite critical of, of his work as well. Um, in the 1930s, we, ha we have a kind of, um, I mean, it's often thought that analytic philosophy was anti-metaphysical. Now, that's, I think, only true of a certain period in analytic philosophy, and is perhaps true of the, the logical positivist. Um, Arguably, it's true uh, of, of, of Wittgenstein, but it certainly wasn't true of the early analytic philosophers, so Frege and Russell and more. And when uh, Susan Sebing first confronts or tries to engage with logic positivism, she says outright that I'm concerned with metaphysics. What does she mean by metaphysics? I think she primarily means trying to understand the basic presuppositions of our thinking. And everyone has certain presuppositions. And she is actually concerned to identify the presuppositions of the kind of analysis that Moore and Wittgenstein and others were doing at the time. And one of those key presuppositions was, was that, to go back to something I said earlier on, that there are basic facts that we're trying to uncover that, as it were, underwrite, underpin the claims uh, that, that we make. Later, uh, towards the end of the 1930s, she starts to be uh, in common with other philosophers at the time, critical of the idea that you could ever uncover uh, you know, an ultimate level of basic facts. And that's something that Wittgenstein himself did. So through the 1930s, you have a transition um, from, um, in, in, uh, as far as the Cambridge School of Analysis is concerned, with a, a view that there are basic facts, a metaphysical level to uncover, to a view that's a little bit more um, uh, question about whether there's some ultimate level. So I think um, Susan Stebbing is 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 um, moving from a more very pro metaphysical view to a view that's perhaps less. I mean, she comes and something I, I didn't talk about specifically, but she actually draws a distinction between um, what she calls same level and new level, or logical analysis and metaphysical analysis. So, to go back to my examples, you give an initial formalization of a sentence in logic, that's your logical analysis, but there's still, um, you still need to specify what facts are that make that true. Now, when one's critical, becomes, starts to become critical about whether there is a, an ultimate level of, of facts, you can still keep in place the, the logical analysis. So what happens throughout the 1930s is a rejection of metaphysical analysis, but a, a holding on to logical analysis. And logical analysis, you can then see, is simply clarify our statements. And that's what one finds in her later work. So her, her work in thinking to some purpose, philosophy and the physicists itself, I think is just concerned with clarifying logically what's involved in certain claims, rather than any bigger metaphysical project of trying to uncover the real nature of the universe or something. So it's a very complicated story. I haven't answered that question very, very well. But I think, yeah, the, the key message is that here's where Stebbing's view, views um, change through the, through the course of the 1930s, at the same time as our, her understanding of Wittgenstein and Wittgenstein's own view changes throughout the 19, uh, 1930s, 1920s to 1930s. I just want to mention, because there may have been a huge amount of overlap between the answer to the next question and what you've just said, but I want to mention a question from Ralph. So it seems to me that Stebbing went beyond the usual preoccupations of analytical, analytic philosophy in attacking the philosophical mystifications of physics. Can you elaborate on how Stebbing differed from her analytical peers? Um, so I can see how that kind of ties into some of the things you've said. I'm wondering, do you see this kind of... Um, 
space for trying to clarify what's going on or the correct way to think about metaphysics in the the work on physics and the in the popular physics works or is this something you see more in her scholarly work uh, well that's, i that's mean Pete, Pete might be better able to talk about the the the, phys, the physics plus in the, the physics what i will say that what's characteristic of her these quite influential um papers that she wrote in the early 1930s about the nature of analysis she she tries to elucidate the assumptions the metaphysical assumptions that underlie the whole project of analysis the kind of analysis that Moore introduced and at the end she comes to the conclusion that actually I mean this is her honesty as well which I think is to her credit that these can't be justified so she's she said look these are other presuppositions that must hold if this form of analysis is to be possible but then she she comes to the conclusion that they can't actually be be justified and that's when as i say this this and th this is something that there's in common to other philosophers at the time they realize that it's actually hard to justify these metaphysical assumptions but that doesn't mean that analysis itself as it were is rejected because there are different forms of analysis that's why Again, going to back to the distinctions I drew earlier, it's important to distinguish forms of analysis because I think, you know, even if you reject a certain kind of metaphysical analysis, there's still a kind of ordinary language or logical analysis that you can still engage in. The project, which is exactly what she does in her later work, of trying to get clear about the, thing, the things that we say. And that's what carries over to the philosophy and the physicists. The physicists say certain things. When you dig down, you realize that they might be committed to all sorts of rather silly things. So you need to show why they're silly. But at the same time, you can give a logical analysis, if you like, or um, that shows what they you know, what might sensibly be, be taken to be, to be um, saying. So it's, it's kind of breaking the, if you like, gap between an ordinary language interpretation that makes some sense of it and the, the tendency that we always have to push that analysis further, deeper, perhaps into regions that we, you know, we're, we're, we're not able to say something meaningful about or whatever. And, and that's what she's still concerned with. Okay. I, 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 yeah. I can just say a little bit about the philosophy and the physicist and, and what other people were doing. So one thing that's this is interesting is there's a re review of that book by C.D. Broad, who is who's another well-known contemporary of hers and, and was a metaphysician. And, and the impression you get reading that review is a little bit kind of, I'm not sure why you've bothered engaging with these people. So, so Broad says, Stebbing's criticism of, of these Physic popular physicist is a bit like shooting baby birds you know it's like what's the point that they we all know they're kind of rubbish at, at making these philosophical moves on the basis of what they're doing in science and so on so that's just one perspective on that question of how similar is how similar is what she's doing in philosophy and phys the physicist to, to what other people were thinking I'm, I'm almost inclined to say this is where one perhaps should point out some of the um, abuse, if you like, that Stebbing, Susan Stebbing had to face. You mentioned C.D. Broad's review. I mean, this I have the quote, quote up here. This is how he, he finishes her, his review of Susan, Susan Stebbing. He says, in conclusion, I express the opinion that we owe debt of gratitude to, to her. Um, the labour cannot have been particularly pleasant, and she must have felt that she might be better occupied than in clearing up the messes made by amateur philosophers. And this is, then is, this is what he says. But at the end of it, she must have enjoyed something of the exhilaration of a good housewife who has at last completed her spring cleaning. And were it not for the ill-omened associations of the phrase, we might congratulate her and her readers on the house being now swept and garnished. I think that is a stunningly sexist end to a review and you know she she was having to face that but it also it actually <laughs> illustrates the point that, that P peter said you know what is what is it what is she doing is she simply clearing up the work of uh, of others and is this really valuable or, or, or not and i think the answer to that is absolutely yes um and you know, this is exactly what she does in thinking to some purpose in philosophy and, and the physicist so she not only does that but she has to contend with that kind of statement from people like cd broad a really important reminder of yeah what she must have been up against in you know and what bravery it must have required to be constantly you know pushing pushing things out into the public like that and i, and I would say yeah no i was going to just say well what comes out i think is that she didn't 
uh, you know, take the bait. She, she would simply get on with her own work. I mean, that's what was extraordinary. She had the most utmost integrity, and despite all the things, and there's lots of other examples, that some, some of them nicely illustrated in Siobhan's biography of, of Susan Stemp. Despite all that, she simply got on and, and did her work. I think she was absolutely incredible woman in, in that respect. I hope I'm not outstepping my role as chair, but it seems like a lot of the tools that she's advocating for other people might help her in that task. You know, if if part of what you think CD Broad is up to in framing things in that way is this kind of project of denigration and nastiness, then maybe the most powerful thing you can do is, is, is not given any air. Um, no. So a related question, um, how does public philosophy practiced by Stebbing before 1945 differ from the public philosophy practiced by women philosophers today in the UK? So I know that's really specific, but I'm just wondering if any of you have thoughts on that kind of angle of things on her versus people doing philosophy in public these days. One thing I would say, I, I was think I just saw this question in the chat earlier and I was thinking about it. I, I'm not sure whether whether Mike and Siobhan agree, but I still think there's a lot more men doing public philosophy than women, you know. So like people that might come to mind if you think of public philosophers today might be people like Daniel Dennett um, or Zizek. So I, I don't know. She I think then she was somewhat standing against the grain and being a woman doing public philosophy and maybe that is not that different today. I mean, I think the way she does public philosophy is different to the way that lots of people who are doing public philosophy today are doing it. I mean, I still think lots of people doing public philosophy today are doing it in a kind of transfer of knowledge way is the way I like to think of it. Of, I'm the person who knows a lot about this and I'm just going to communicate that all to you and it's up to you what you do with it. Whereas Stebbing wasn't like that, you know, she wasn't, especially with text, I think, to some purpose, and it wasn't necessarily about trying to get you to learn this and that and this, it was trying to get you to do things. So that seems like, a, like an important difference between Stebbing and, and lots of, maybe because since Stebbing's time, there's more of a clear difference today between philosophy and something like critical thinking. Um, so maybe what Stebbing's doing, you'd find in texts of critical thinking. But I think that's an important difference. Yeah, I mean, one thing that Stebbing certainly wasn't was self-promotional. Um, and when she was in the public domain, and when she was doing her, her lectures or, or her radio talks or publishing books like Thinking to Some Purpose, it, it was never about look at me doing philosophy or, or look at my ideas. It was, you know, exactly as we've been saying, it was about getting people to to think in, in, in for themselves and, and sort of um, showing them examples of how they might um, intellectually at least might live their lives. And so I think, I mean, I, I don't want to criticize any particular current day public philosophers, but it, it was, certainly was never about self-promotion. I suppose as well, the possibility of anonymity was kind of available to her or, you know, relative anonymity in a way that maybe, you know, makes it less, attractive a prospect for women philosophers to get into the public sphere and start speaking their mind as well. I don't know if, if that context is relevant too. So this is a very last quick question because we're down to our last minute um, from Nathan. So uh, just a question for each guest. So if you could all just give a quick answer, if you could recommend one sort of paper or book or just something, some aspect of her writing that you found particularly striking, uh, you know, what would it be and why? Um, Happy to go with who's ever ready. <laughs> Tell you what I really like, and this is going to be a surprising choice. I really like A Modern Elementary Logic, which was a book that Stebbing published right at the end of her life. It's a much shorter, much simpler text than A Modern Introduction to Logic, specifically designed to people who were, were learning logic. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm aware of time here, but uh, learning logic for themselves, perhaps without a tutor, perhaps returning from, from the war and, and, and needing to, to pick up. And it's an amazing text because it does introduce a lot of logical principles in a very uh, user-friendly way, but it also includes those kind of real life examples and that sort of concentration on natural language use that we were talking about earlier. Thanks. I mean, for me, the book has to be thinking to some purpose. It's a whole book. If you wanted a chapter, the, the chapter that Peter mentioned on, on Potter thinking would be a good good introduction to what she's she talking about. It's, it's brilliant, really. Okay, it's it might, might seem dated, but actually there's so many analogies with what's happening today that, that you, you know you can't help but see them. that that is just really is a brilliant book i i would also i have to say thank you to some purpose i think that we should all be reading that uh, as a set text in undergraduate philosophy degrees in a level philosophy classes so i think everybody should be reading that <laughs>
Okay, so get the book, buy the mug, thank you to some purpose and elementary logic as well. Okay, thank you so much to our speakers. Just like to remind our audience that next Tuesday we've got What's Wrong with Rights, uh, in which our panel will discuss the limitations of the human rights model. So thank you so much to everyone and have a nice evening. Goodbye.